Welcome to DTLT Today. I'm Tim Owens. This is Andy Rush, as you know, and uh, we've got a really exciting topic for today. I've been talking a little bit in the office with some colleagues about this piece of software called Learning Catalytics. It's a piece of software out of Harvard University, a um, faculty member there who actually came to Mary Washington about three years back to speak to us, Eric Mazur. And so I don't have him on the line, but I've actually got Brian Lukoff on the line with us, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about the software. So how's it going, Brian? Great. So How are you? I, I'm doing well. So if you could, um, just for our audience members, talk to us a little bit about what Learning Catalytics is. Sure. So Learning Catalytics, it's, a, it's a, basically a platform for managing an interactive classroom. Um, so the, the, the core functionality is a audience response system where students can participate in class but not using clickers using the consumer devices they're already bringing to class so students can use their iphone their ipad laptop android phone whatever that they're bringing to class that, that's web enabled and then what we can do is since they're using a consumer device that has a rich um, a rich inter interaction with it we can do much more than just multiple choice questions so we can have students doing questions where they use their finger on their screen or click their mouse to sketch a graph or show the direction of a, a vector or enter algebraic responses or all, all sorts of, of much richer, um, more authentic interactions than, than you can do with a typical clicker system. And then what we've actually done is built on top of that a, a platform for really going beyond just responses to, to really let the, let the instructor really create a much more um, exciting interactive environment. So, for example, one of the things that, that Eric Mazur developed over the past couple of um, decades has been this, this peer instruction teaching methodology, where you use audience response systems to ask students questions, but instead of just asking students a question and then putting up, say, the distribution of responses and saying, okay, well, the answer is B, let's move on, you can actually, you actually put up the, um, the question, have students respond, and then say to students, okay, turn to your neighbor and try to convince your neighbor that your answer is correct. And so what you typically typically see when you do this is that when you ask students to respond to the question again, the percent correct goes way up um, because students are just better at explaining things to each other than um, often than instructors are. And so this is a really effective um, um, teaching methodology that's been validated by a lot of research. And we realized that with, with, this, with these consumer devices, we could actually integrate audience response technology with a system that let us go beyond what we could do before um, with peer instruction. So for example, instead of saying to students, okay, turn to your neighbor and try to convince your neighbor that your answer is correct, we could actually have the system take control of that interaction and have the system automatically group students into groups to really optimize the productivity of those discussions. So for example, we can group students based on their response patterns so that we're going to group Bob with Steve on his left if we think Bob and Steve are going to have a good conversation, or we'll group Bob with Joe on his right if we think they'll have a good conversation, and each student gets individual messages on their display um, saying who they, sh they should be talking to. So we can basically let the instructor create a really rich classroom environment um, with, with lots of different kinds of interactions without creating a very complex classroom. They basically have to use one, one piece of technology. So that's interesting. So you're saying that the software then figures out who the person should be talking to, what's the kind of idea, like, how does the software do that? I mean, it, what data is it using, I guess, is my question. Yeah, so we're actually, part of our ongoing research in, in our research group is actually looking at what are the best algorithms to use um, to to group students effectively for effective discussion. But our, our preliminary... ...to have answers. You know, even if, they're, if they're, even if they're both wrong, just grouping students with different answers leads to a, a huge gain in productivity. Mm -hmm. So, and, and our system's flexible enough that we can, as we do more research, we can encode into the system different kinds of, of grouping policies. That's awesome. So, so the software knows where the students are sitting. I, I think there's like a seat chart. Is that basically where the students say where they're sitting, or how does that work? Exactly. So as the instructor, at the beginning of the semester, you can go into the system and use a little uh, drag and drop tool to show what the layout of your classroom looks like. And then every day when students come in and they lock onto the system, they either enter the seat number they're sitting in if your seats are numbered, or they can just look at a seating map and just like they would pick an airline seat if they were picking a flight, they can sort of show us where they're sitting. 
And then that lets us do the grouping because we can only group students that are sitting adjacent to each other. So there's not this sort of chaos of students getting up and walking around the classroom. But what we can also do is we can also show the instructor after students have responded, um, regardless of whether or not you do the grouping, you can see as the instructor what the distribution is around the room of correct and incorrect responses. So you can see this, this seat map light up with red and green boxes. Um, and you, as an, you can get a sense of where the right and wrong answers are around the room. So let's say students are having a discussion and maybe you have 60 seconds as an instructor to walk around and listen to student conversations and maybe you know drop a few hints here and there. Looking at this map gives you a sense of where you should go to. So often you might, you might find that there might be pockets of, of places in the room where you have all the students sitting around each other that all have the wrong answer. And so that might be a place you might go to when students are having a discussion to just maybe drop a hint or listen to what students are saying so you can get a sense of what the, the real misconceptions are. Yeah, one thing I, I love about the software, I've been playing with it for just a little over a week now, week and a half, and one thing that really strikes me is that it's not, as you said, just polling software. You know, a lot of uh, professors come to me and they go, well, I want to poll, and have you heard of poll everywhere, the website, and this and that, but it's just sort of, that's that's fine if all you want to do is polling, but it seems like your software looks at it completely outside of the technological aspect and looks at it more from a pedagogical aspect. Is that right? Yeah, that, that, that's been our guiding philosophy all along. Um, is that you know we, we really want to design something that that has a pedagogy behind it. It's not just a, a cool technology. So you know we, you know Eric obviously has a lot of um, education work behind him. You know I come from technology, but also from the world of education as well. So we both really wanted to, you know, we all wanted to build a system that that would really have a solid pedagogy behind it and would really be something that would be useful for teachers and not just sort of a gee whiz, isn't is this cool technology? And tell me a little bit. So you mentioned Eric. How is Eric using this in his classes now and how long has it been in use at Harvard? It's, it doesn't feel too much like beta software, to be quite honest. I've been using it for a little bit and it, it feels, you know, like you've been using it for a while now and you're just now starting to get out in the public. What's the history behind it? Thanks, yeah. It's actually, it, it's relatively new. We, we started developing on it last fall. Um, and last spring we piloted it in, a, in Eric's course, um, an introductory physics course here at Harvard, um, and, and got a lot of interest from people who came to, to, to observe the class and just people who we were talking to. You know, we had, we had a lot of success with it in during the course in the, in the spring and you know no no problems running it so we realized that we were at a point where we could start to to release this to other institutions and like how many institutions do you think are using it right now roughly well so we're, we're kind of you know we're, we're in this in between period because we're still we're still in the summer right <laughs> uh, so you know right right, right the second no one because it's, it's, still, it's still the summer <laughs> right but we have we have, some, we have some institutions signed up um, to, who'll be using it in the, in the fall at at different levels, um, both higher ed and then also um, in K twelve. Okay, uh, if any of our audience members were interested in this, where could they find more information about it and whatnot? What's the process? Yeah, so so our, our website at learningcatalytics dot com okay. um, is they, was where they can find out more information. They can um, we've we've put up a, a little screenshot tour so they can see what the product's about. And they can also, from there, request an invitation, and then we can uh, potentially give them a, a, an instructor account so they can start playing around with the software. And and I'll say from my personal standpoint, y'all have been awesome because for me, just playing around with it for the past week and a half, I've sent in a few support requests, and you've been, like, really quick to respond. It just seems, you know, it doesn't have that feel of a company where you've got to put in a ticket and then hope that someone's going to read it and then go through their help desk with multiple support channels, and you've been emailing me directly back, uh, you know, sometimes within 20 minutes of when I, you know, had a question about it. <laughs> or so, even when you didn't have a question. Or even, yeah, when I didn't even have a question, it's like, hey, we noticed this on our server that this happened so so kudos to you for that <laughs> thank you yeah that, that, that's something that, that that's important to us and i think you know as an instructor when you use the technology you want to be sure that you know people the people who are behind the technology are going to support it um and can get a stand behind it and that, that's that's what we aim to do and you know speaking of buying so i, I know it's not free and I'd, you talk talk to me a little bit about the model of uh how people go about you know paying for it and support for it and that kind of thing just so people know sure yeah so the the, the model that we've set up is that instructors can sign up for free um and 
you know, any number of instructors can use it for free. And then the idea is that as a, with a free instructor account, what you can do is you can go and you can, you know, as you've seen, you can, you can create questions. Um, you can see what it's like to deliver questions because your instructor account also functions as a student account. So you can actually take your instructor account, you know, grab your mobile device and log in as a student and then actually see what it's like to participate in a class as a student. So you can see the, the, the full flow um, with a free instructor account. And then when institutions and instructors want to move um, to use it in their in their classroom, then we just we just charge for student accounts. And then, you know, if if people are interested in, in doing that, they should just get in touch with us, and, and we can work with them to develop a proposal for something that'll work in their institution. Awesome. Well, sounds good. Well, Brian, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. I, I think the software is awesome. I think our audience is going to benefit from knowing more about it and knowing more about you guys. And I'm excited that you, you took an idea that was interesting at Harvard, interesting in a classroom, and you've sort of blown it up to actually be something that you know people can use in other institutions. I think that's great. Thank you. Thanks, and thanks, thanks so much for having me. All right. Take care. See you, Brian. And we're done with DTLT today. Um, it, look, we want to have more topics of conversation like this. So if you have other people you want us to interview or anything that you're interested in, um, any questions real quick while I've still got Brian on the line. Uh, one person mentioned, is there any way we can see a demonstration of the software in a classroom environment? Do you have any videos online or anything yet? Um, that's a good question. That, that's something we'll, we'll definitely consider going forward. Um, and, maybe, and certainly in the fall as people are using it, maybe we can get permission to, to videotape in the classroom. Um, but we don't have that available yet. Okay. Any other questions from anyone? I know Rowan's in there. Todd had to jump out real quick, but I'll take more questions if anyone has them. Like did, an observation video, yeah. Did we, kind of, did we kind of make it clear that it was kind of any, any device, any mobile device, anything that connects to the net is, is basically going to be... Yeah, so, so to be clear, like they can use a laptop too if they don't have a smartphone or a tablet, correct? Yeah, laptop, um, smartphone, tablet. Um, we actually had someone last semester on a Kindle. Oh, wow. So that, that, that works too. Okay. Um, you know, cer certain kinds of questions, um, you know, let's say we, there's some questions that take advantage of the fact that it's, you have a touch screen or a... A mouse, so those won't work on the Kindle, but right. sure. you know, for the most part, any any device that can connect, can connect to the internet will work. All right, okay. awesome. Well, I think that's all the questions. Again, thank you, Brian, for uh, joining us, and thank you everyone out there for watching along. You've been watching DTLT today, and uh, you'll catch us every day at 4 p.m. Thanks a lot, y'all. See you.